that brooding little opus was written in 1932 by the Italian composer Alfredo Casella. And if I hadn't seen his name on the manuscript, I think I'd have been inclined to bet that its author was a Swede or a Finn or perhaps a North German. Its spare, dour counterpoint has a decidedly northern sound to my ears, an entirely appropriate sound to be sure, since the title of the piece is Richard Carey on the name B-A-C-H. I wasn't being pedantic just now, spelling out box name for you like that. Casella hyphenates each letter on his title page, and those four letters, which according to the German notational convention, represent the notes we prefer to call B-flat, A, C, and B natural, pa, di, 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 form the thematic substance of the piece and appear by my count and in various permutations no less than 56 times in the course of its five minutes duration. Making up fugues, canons, or ricercares on the name Bach was an old trick, first practiced by Johann Sebastian himself. Schumann did it, so did Liszt. Arnold Schoenberg used that motive as part of the row for his first 12-tone composition. And sometimes, especially in the 19th century, the appearance of those four notes in a fugal context signaled a certain amount of contrapuntal grandstanding. But I can't detect any hint of exhibitionism in Casella's piece. It appears to me to have been motivated not so much by the notes those letters represent, but by the name they form. And in that respect, it's the prototypical 1930s composition. In the 30s, Bach's reputation finally caught up with the quality of his work. 150 years of campaigns waged by such luminaries as Baron von Swieten or Felix Mendelssohn had finally paid off. The name of Bach was now synonymous with musical integrity. Bach, of course, had always been regarded as a technical whiz, but his spirit had never before dominated a decade as it did the 30s. Virtually every major composer was determined to follow his example, to work as it was deemed he had worked, as an artisan, a sober, conscientious craftsman for whom diligence and inspiration were inextricably intertwined. Uh, Stravinsky, for example, claimed that his Dunbarton Oaks concerto was written in the spirit of the Brandenburgs. The Brazilian Hydrovilla Lobus began his celebrated series of Bacchianas Brasileiras, Latin tunes ecumenically merged with Lutheran harmony. But no composer, perhaps, was better equipped for this neo bachian revival than Paul Hindemith. A hard worker by nature, a superb contrapuntist by training, Hindemith was deeply concerned about the artist's relevance to society. In fact, he wrote his masterpiece, the opera Matister Mahler, on precisely that subject. And as a result of that concern, was much involved with the concept which became known as Gebrauchsmusik, literally music for a workaday purpose. This involved the production of scores for specific occasions or specific groups, for school bands, for example, for amateurs, for Felix the Cat. He wrote a background score for one of the celebrated feline cinematic endeavors, and it constituted Hindemith's rejection of the romantic notion of the artist as ivory tower inmate. One of his most notable Gebrauchsmusik projects was the composition of sonatas for every orchestral instrument from tuba on up. It's become almost traditional to say of these works that they always represent a mean level of confidence, but that they seldom suggest inspiration. Now, it's certainly true that one can sometimes see the splices going through to use the lingo of tape editing, and that some of the sonatas are rather mechanical and predictable. On the other hand, there are masterpieces in their midst. The Sonata for French Horn is possibly the greatest solo work ever written for that instrument, and all of them contain effective and idiomatic writing, and a few of them at least moments that are quite extraordinarily moving. The sonata that we've included in this program, the one for trumpet and piano, contains just such a moment. It occurs during the last minute of the piece when Hindemith appends a coda and supers in the trumpet part the tune of this Bach chorale. That's the beginning of the tune as Bach used it for an organ chorale prelude, but Hindemith resets it in the minor mode and affects a rhythmic gear shift so that Bach's four beats to the bar in his adaptation become three. not at all coincidentally, is called All Mention Mission Sterben, All Men Must Die. And 
When one compares the two versions, it's useful to keep in mind that Bach's relatively upbeat presentation is the byproduct of a theological approach in which the death of the individual is always linked to the concept of resurrection and afterlife and celebrated accordingly. Hindemith never indulged in programmatic data, but he probably had a different kind of death in mind when he wrote his very somber version of this chorale. For the year was 1939 and World War II had just begun. Raymond Cossera is going to play the first and third movements of the Sonata for Trumpet and Piano by Paul Hindemith.